remember, in this world of raising private money and doing business with private lenders, we make the rules. You see, when I was borrowing money from the banks, they made the rules. The bank and the institutional lenders set the interest rate. They set the term. They set the frequency of payments. Um, and, you know, they have to look up your skirt at all of your personal information and verification of income and all that kind of stuff. Well, in this world, we make the rules. I, as the borrower, and it took me a little bit to get my mind wrapped around this. There's no negotiating with my private lenders. This is the program, right? And if you like another program, then go invest your money in some other program. Welcome to the Cashflow Fight Club podcast. I'm Mike Deaton. And I'm Ligia Deaton. Together as co-hosts in life, business, and this podcast, we're matching up the heavyweights of cash flow creation to see who reigns supreme. We do this so you can discover the best way for you to generate transformational cash flow and pursue the life of your dreams. So whether you're a side hustle seeker, full-time entrepreneur, or just looking to create job quitting cash flow like we did, hit subscribe and grab your ringside seat for the most entertaining and informative investing show on the airwaves. Let's get in the arena. Let's do it. OPM, other people's money. It is the superpower of real estate investing. And today we have a matchup between two different ways to find money for real estate investments. On one side of today's matchup, using passive investors. Investors' capital can be pooled together to make down payments on assets by taking a limited partnership stake in the asset. The rest of the funds then come from financial institutions in the form of loans, otherwise known as banks. This model leverages the power of syndications to purchase and operate real estate assets like apartment buildings and mobile home parks. On the other side of today's matchup, 100% funding using private money. One or a few people put up the capital to outright purchase assets and get a low risk fixed rate of return over the life of the deal. No banks or financial loans required. This model is used for flipping homes, for instance. Buy it make improvements, and resell for a profit, just in and out of deals in as little as nine months in a very clean arrangement. These are two great models to build your real estate empire. So let's introduce today's guests. Representing the power of investors and syndications, this power couple is fighting out of Orlando, Florida, where they run the Remote Multifamily Investing Academy. Both having been in the real estate industry for over 10 years, they started out with smaller investments and have built their business up to acquiring and operating larger multifamily properties. They now educate hundreds of others on exactly how to do the same and build their own wealth in real estate. Please welcome to the show, the Warriors of Wealth, Jen and Stacy Conkey. Fighting out of Moorhead, North Carolina, our next guest has been flipping homes in his small community for over 20 years. After taking a cheap shot from banks in January of 2009, he pivoted to an even better solution, Be The Bank. He's now completed hundreds of projects solely funded with private money and provided those investors a great return on investment and in situations in which all the variables are controlled. Please welcome to the Cashflow Fight Club Arena, Jay, the private money authority, Connor. Get ready to learn all about two great ways to fund your deals with other people's money. Let's get to it. Okay, Jen and Stacy Conkey, Jake Connor, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you on today. Thank you for having awesome. us. Awesome. To be here. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be fun. So, um, we'll we'll dive in here in a few seconds, but just. Um, you know, Jay, you're, you're about private money. It sounds like you're a little more residential in style. Jay, uh, Jen and Stacy, you guys are, um, in a multifamily space and a little more, uh, larger residential properties and, uh, raising capital for that. So, uh, this will give a fun glimpse into a couple different ways to come about it. And we'll, we'll dive into the pros and cons of all that. As a reminder for the audience, we'll run through three rounds. First round is really just getting to know the guests. Round two, we'll overview the business model. And then round three, the gloves come off and we'll <laughs> dig deeper into each before we crown a champ. So 
with that, let's dive in. Ladies first, Jen and Stacey, why don't you give us a bit about your background and how you got to be in the world of multifamily? Sure. So for, for me, I started back in, it was late 2002, early 2003. My brother came over, started talking about flipping. So that's what I started doing. And I, I did that all the way until 2015. I was flipping, wholesaling, getting into all of the plexes for buy and hold strategies. Um, went through the 2008 crisis, if you will. All of that joy before I met Stacy in 2015. And by the time I met Stace, she was already doing apartment investing, which is what I wanted to be doing. And uh, she had a very specific methodology that was interesting to me on smaller apartments. So I thought I want to date her more. So we did. And then we joined forces. And for the past nine years, we've just been lockstep going for it and scaling using joint venture and then syndication. Um, That's pretty much us in a nutshell. Okay. Okay. And you guys, uh, I think I think all of you are somewhat East Coast based. You guys are in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. We're in, yes, yeah, we're yeah. in Orlando, Florida. Awesome. All right, Mr. Connor, how about you? Well, uh, I'm here in a real teeny tiny town called Moorhead City, North Carolina, population 8,000 people. Our entire market that we invest in has only got 40,000 people in it. And I don't do like a ton of deals. In fact, I've never wholesaled a deal in my life. I ain't got nobody to wholesale it to, if you know what I mean. I've, 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 stayed, I've stayed in every deal I've ever done. I went full time. My wife, Carol Joy and I, she's from Texas. We went full time investing here in Eastern North Carolina all the way back in 2003. And we do right now two to three deals a month. But our average profit right now is $82,000 per single family house. And that's net net. That's after realtor fees, after carrying costs, after private lender and all that. Now, I don't say that to brag about myself. I say that to make a point. There's a big argument to be made when you invest in outlying areas, not in the big cities where you don't have the competition. I ain't got anybody else to speak of playing in my sandbox right here. Until now. And so uh, and so doing three, de- <laughs> doing three deals a month, averaging eight or $2,000 per deal. The purpose of sharing that is to share with everybody. You don't have to be in a big market to make significant income, right? And so for the first six years that we were investing in uh, single family houses, and that is my focus. I mean, I've done commercial, I've done condominium developments, shopping centers from the ground up, but my love and my passion is single family houses. So the first six years, I relied on the banks, institutional money to fund our deals. That's all I knew to do. I never heard of private money, private lending, self-directed IRAs, all that stuff. I didn't even know about buying creative subject to the existing note and all that stuff. And so 2003 to 2009, I went down to the bank, right, to get my deals uh, funded. And, you know, I had a big wake-up call on my lands. I had a big wake-up call in January 2009. I called up my banker. I had two deals under contract to fund And I learned like that over the phone, my line of credit had been shut down with no notice. And that's when my whole world changed. I'll tell that story when it's time. Right on. What were you doing prior to 03 before you got into uh, flipping houses? Well, you're not not flipping, you're buying holes. What town are you in, Mike and uh, Lydia? Well, so oddly enough, we're in Woodland Park, Colorado, which is also about a town of 8,000 people. So we're we're pretty small. We're outside of Colorado Springs, though. So we're about 30 minutes okay. away for, for a little bigger market. <laughs> the reason I ask, because I'm getting ready to tell you what I did before 2003, you're not going to have a clue what I'm talking about. But Jen and Stacy are going to really know what I'm talking about because they're down there in Florida. I was in the mobile home business. They used to call them wobbly boxes. They called them trailers. <laughs> and and then and then we got real fancy and called them manufactured homes. Yeah. And you know, we used to we used to call it putting underpinning underneath the house. Well, uh-huh. it ain't underpinning when I came was foundational site and give me a break. But anyway, I was in that business for years. In fact, I was raised in that, in that industry. My father, Wallace Connor, who's now 90 years old, and he's got a 300 house development going on right now. But um, anyway, he was the largest retailer of manufactured homes in the nation at one time. But the reason we got out of it 
is because the consumer financing for the product of mobile homes, manufactured homes, pretty much went away, fell out of favor at Wall Street. I knew if I ever got out of manufactured housing, uh, I wanted to get into single single family homes. So this market is so crazy. I've sold a lot of homes over the years on rent to own, lease purchase. But in this market, I'm buying, fixing up, flipping just as hard as I can because that's what the market wants here because mm. we have no inventory. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, interesting the way the, the market cycles work and the different asset classes that that come and go for sure. Um, Jen and Stacy, what about what about you two? Um, prior to getting into real estate, um, did you have a corporate career or or what was your background? I did. I uh, I worked in corporate America for twenty two years between man TRW safety systems, Target, Home Depot just working my way up the uh, corporate ladder while doing real estate investing on the side for, I did that for 12 years. So I was in corporate America for 22 years and yeah. 12 of it, I was doing a side hustle of real estate. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, for me, I was um, in, I was in corporate America. My background is accounting. So I was worked at Arthur Anderson for a couple of years, got my CPA license and then went on to work uh, in a accounting position for a public company for a couple of years before I started investing. Okay. Yeah. That's super interesting. Uh, the The journeys are fascinating. A lot of times when you talk to people in the real estate business, there, there's such a wide uh, array of, of different people that get called into um, all these different asset classes. So that's, uh, there, there's no one way to do it uh, is the point there. I mean, you can certainly go all in all at once or, or side hustle it for, for years, um, use bank money use not bank money so yeah there's there's a lot of different ways to get in that's what we love about real estate so much but um jay why don't we stay with you for a bit and uh walk us through a little bit more about what you're doing today so it sounds like you you experienced some pain in the 08 09 great recession that uh, so many people um that were in at least smaller residential properties uh really took a beating um, but out of that, you you took a different approach, it sounds like, and um, and go about things a little differently. So uh, walk us through that. Yeah, very different these days. So I remember it like it was yesterday, y'all. Um, you may find it hard to believe here in North Carolina, we actually still have these things called handsets with cords attached to them. That actually has got a telephone on the other end of it. But anyway... <laughs> I was sitting here at my desk. It was January 2009, and I picked up this very telephone, and I called my banker. His name was Steve, and I'd been doing business with Steve for six years. Uh, he was with Branch Bank and Trust at the time, bb and and that, that's, that was where I got how I got my deals funded. So I called up Steve. I had these two houses under contract, and I told him about the deals. Steve and I had had this kind of conversation many, many times. And Steve says, well, Jay, I'm sorry, but we're not loaning money out to real estate investors anymore. And I said, what? My first thought was, I sure wish I'd known that before I went and put earnest money down on those two houses. I said, Steve, what in the world do you mean you've shut down my line of credit? I've, I've, I've paid my payments on time for six years and I got a great credit score. What's the deal? He says, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? I said, no, but now you just gave me a global financial crisis because <laughs> I ain't got any way to fund my deals right here, don't you see? So, and I hung up the phone. And by the way, these people going around saying, oh, every problem is an opportunity. I want to throw up. I didn't have no opportunity. I had a problem, right? With no way to fund my deals. And so I sat here for a second and I thought to myself, who do I know that can help me with my problem? And immediately when I asked myself that question, Jeff Blankenship came to mind. Well, Jeff was a good friend at the time and still is. He was living in Greensboro, North Carolina, and he was investing in single family houses. And I called him up and told him what happened. And he said, well, Jay, welcome to the club. I said, what club? He said, the club of being shut down at the bank. They shut me down last week. I said, well, how are you going to fund your deals? And he says, well, have you heard about private money? I said, no. He said, have you heard about self-directed IRAs and how people can move their retirement funds over to a self-directed IRA company and loan money out to you? I said, no. 
So Jeff introduced me to this private, this sort of private money and, and self-directed IRAs. And so here's what I did. I said, I'm going to go about this whole thing of getting funding 180 degrees different direction. And here's what I did. I put my private money program together as to what I was going to offer individuals. Now, when we say private money, I'm not talking hard money or institutional money. I'm talking about raising money from individuals. And I, so the first thing I did is I put my program together as to how I was going to teach people in my own network what private money is and how they can get high rates of return safely and securely. And you know, the traditional way to borrow money is like I was doing. You go down to the bank and you get on your hands and knees and you put your hand underneath your chin and you say, please fund my deal, right? But in this world, did you know I've never asked anybody for money since 2008? And, and they say, Jay, have you got eight and a half million dollars in private money that you move from project to project and you don't ask anybody for money? Well, here's the secret right here. I put on my teacher hat, my teacher hat, my teacher hat says private money teacher. And that's the whole attitude I took. I said, look, I'm not going to beg, chase, uh, persuade, try to sell anybody or anything. I'm going to educate. I'm going to lead with a servant's heart. And I'm going to teach people that I know what private money is and how they can get involved totally passively. And I did that. And so in less than 90 days, I was able to attract without chasing. I was able to attract two and a half million dollars, um, not two and a half, two million, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in private money from individuals. Now, here's the secret. Here's the secret. I did not go around pitching those two deals that I had under contract. Here's what I learned. Desperation has got a smell to it, right? <laughs> right? And so what I did is I started teaching people just the program without any kind of deal in the conversation. And then when they tell me they like the program, they tell me how much they want to invest or if I need to introduce them to myself to write to the IRA company that I recommend for them to move their retirement funds over or they're just using liquid capital. They tell me how much they got to work. And here's the secret. I say, look, I'm going to put your money to work for you just as soon as possible. So then a few days go by and I call them up with the good news phone call. Well, what's the good news phone call? The good news phone call is I call them up. Let's say Jen is one of my new private lenders and she's got $150,000. She's told me that she wants to invest. So I call up Jen. We'll have a little chit chat. And I say, Jen, I got great news. I can now put your $150,000 to work. I got a house over here in Newport under contract with an after repaired value of 200,000. The funding required is what you got, 150,000. Notice that 75% of the after repaired value. And Jen, the fund or the closing is next Friday, so you'll need to have your uh, funds wired to my real estate attorney by next Thursday, and I'm going to have my attorney email you the wiring instructions. Now notice I did not ask Jen if she wants to fund the deal. That's the most stupid question in the world I could ask her. Of course she wants to fund the deal, particularly if she's moved that 150000 from a retirement fund over to a self-directed IRA. She ain't making any money until I put her money to work. So we separate the conversation of teaching the program and then having a deal to fund. Love it. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, very brilliant. Um, I know I, I've spoken to a lot of people and, and we've done it ourselves where uh, when you come at the conversation or when you come at it from the standpoint that you think you're asking somebody for money or funds, it becomes a very uncomfortable conversation to have for most people, unless I guess you're a sociopath or something. But if you come <laughs> at it from, from another angle where you are teaching and you are offering someone a great way to make a return on their investment and you're transparent about uh, all the ins and outs of the deal, then yeah, it becomes a very different conversation altogether. I love that approach. It's so true that your, your, your problem totally led you into your, your greatest opportunity back then. Oh, it did. Careful. It did. It <laughs> definitely ended up being, I mean, it was the biggest blessing in disguise. I mean, here's the deal. And I, and Jen, I know uh, you and Stacy, all of y'all remember this. Back in 2007, 8, and 9, you had all these foreclosures coming on, onto the market, and the banks weren't loaning money. Now, think about that scenario. 
All these foreclosures, banks aren't loaning monies, right? I mean, that's sort of a quagmire. But listen, thanks to private money and being cut off from the bank, our first year in 2009 using private money, our business tripled because I had all this private money that I could use from individuals and I could pick and choose the foreclosures that I wanted to buy. Yeah, it, it's great. Great way to, to have taken advantage of, of a situation and, and really going, gone into that. Let's put a pin in that for a second and uh, flip over to Jen and Stacy. Why don't you walk us through um, the capital raising aspect of, of side of your business there for us? And we'll, we'll have that for a comparison point. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think that for, for most people, the biggest struggle when you're getting into any kind of, any kind of real estate investing, because this is the case for me in 2003, when I got started on just my first house and my first duplex, I was really stuck on, well, how, how am I going to, I don't have money. I don't have a lot of money. I, you know, just kind of do my life. How am I going to do this? And so I was, that was a really big sticking point for me. And I worked through it and learning about partnering and, and connecting with people and building it that way and some private money. Uh, but as we've gone on and, you know, when I go, no, you guys know we have a, an academy. So we end up dealing with a lot of people who are in the newer stages of multifamily, not necessarily new to real estate, but new to multifamily. And that's their biggest sticking point because the numbers are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's less and less likely someone has that capital on their own to do the deal. So it's not hard for me at all to jump back 20 years and a half a second and remember exactly what that feeling is. And I know that for me, that first time where I was like, man, I, I found a deal. How am I going to get the money? I had a lot of angst because I felt like I was having to go and ask for money. And what was really interesting is my first partner who I met at a real estate investing club, because was, there was no social media back then. It was all in-person networking. And, it wasn't even YouTube back then. Yeah, no, there wasn't even YouTube. There was like none of that. <laughs> it was all in person. And I was talking to someone and I just mentioned, they were asking about me. I was asking about them. And I just mentioned, yeah, I just got a property under contract. And they were like, you did? Oh my gosh, tell me all about that. And I was like, oh, okay. And so what I discovered through that conversation and many similar conversations is there's a lot of people that want to do real estate investing or they want to get into multifamily and they have no idea how or they do not have the time or the desire to go and learn it, but they have capital. And so I started realizing based on how excited they got that I had a deal that I needed money for, I was like, oh, I, maybe this isn't so much about me needing money, although I do. It's more about giving them an opportunity to put their money to work in a way that they wouldn't have the chance to do it otherwise. So it was a really big shift for me that thankfully happened fairly early in my career. And we've been able to pass that along because all of our students, when they're new, they are freaked out. They have all this like money energy issues. Like, Oh, you know, Jen has to do tons of mindset work with them because everybody feels like I'm asking for money. So I think that's one of the biggest shifts is recognizing that it is a real thing for people to have money sitting in the bank, which stresses them out. We've been in that position before when we were just we, were, we just did a cross-country move. We had launched the academy a year before. We had multiple deals going on. We were so busy and we had, what, $200,000? It was almost $300,000. Almost $300,000 that we were like, we need to put this to work. And we yeah. couldn't. We yeah. didn't have time. Even if we had all the knowledge of all the contacts to go find a deal, we didn't have the time to do a deal. And that was the first time I recognized what it's like for someone to be in that position where their money is not working and they don't have a way to put it to work. Even though we had the knowledge, we didn't have the time. So thankfully, we found someone who has had a deal and we were like, well, okay, let's put our money into their deal. And we were like, oh, thank God. Thank God we found them because otherwise our money is just depleting, you know, from not appreciation, from um, inflation. <laughs> yes, that. Yeah, that. <laughs> that old chestnut. Um, and really, so even though I knew it in theory from the other side that whole time, for the first time, I was like, I get it. This is a real problem for people. And it's a real true need that they need to put their money into something that they either don't know how or don't have time. And we've been able to now, you know, not only really envelop that our, ourselves or adopt that ourselves, but really pass that along to other newer investors so they can look at it from a different standpoint and really feel good about giving people an opportunity to invest with them in their deals. Yeah. 
people. Yeah, it, it's a, a unique take on things, but somehow a little bit similar to to Jay's story, right? It's it's uh, being able I to have- allow people to kind of participate in something that they aren't normally uh, able to do, especially on the multifamily side. Yes, as you mentioned, things get really big really quickly in terms of, you know, seven, eight figure deals. And uh, the amount of capital that's needed, even just for the down payment, is uh, a lot of times, you know, I mean, most people can't 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 fund that um, by themselves. So I think this is a good point to uh, transition into round three. We can dig a little bit deeper. Um, We'll stay with you guys, Jen and Stacey. Um, so on raising money, some, some of the ins and outs, uh, at maybe a little bit deeper level. So, um, what types of, are you doing, um, we'll get a little technical here, but like 503B, 503C, a little bit of both, uh, does, is it deal specific, um, return profiles that you chase, uh, in terms of the, the deals that you, um, commit and close to things like that. We only do 506Cs now, but up until that point, we, we had been doing 506Bs, um, just joint ventures. So we, we have a, I'm a strategist. So I'll just, I mean, let me chunk it up a little bit. Like I believe in, <laughs> you got to have a strategy and there's a time and a place in the market for each strategy. So for us, like when I first started I, raising capital for me, like my first duplex was 40 grand, being able to go to somebody and say, Hey, there's this cool opportunity and get private money for that back then made a lot of sense. And in the beginning, having that strategy of going for pure private money, no lending and just applying Mm -hmm. that, it made a lot of sense back then. And then on a long enough timeline, you start to notice that you run out of money. (laughs) Anybody can just start running out of money. Your resources are not there anymore. So in order to scale faster, using, you know, leverage is the way to go. So for us, Going with a joint venture, getting some active partners into a deal that bring money, also have an active role. That was like the first stair step. Then going into 506Bs, asking friends and family for money, the next stair step. And then in order to truly scale and get into larger things with larger acquisition fees, being able to do a 506C and advertise and get people out there looking for specific accredited investors. I think that that's really been what we've been, it's our secret weapon to have a strategy for each time of life, Mm -hmm. if you will. Um, And I feel like when it comes to uh, Jay and and our, we we have a lot in common and it's like, we, we are driven by impact, right? He, he's, he wanted to leave with lead with service. We lead with service. Our, our biggest value, our top value is results. And in, in order to get results at that level, I am a strong believer that you have to have options. So, we are are big believers in options. I love the small market. We also invest in the Midwest, but we invest everywhere in the Midwest, not just one little pocket because it gives us options. And having those options, it allows us to stay fluid and flexible as things Mm -hmm. pop up. So that, you know, if a lender were to say to us, you're not, we're not going to give you a line of credit anymore. um, We just adjust similar to what Jay did. He adjusted. So, being able to have multiple options is what has help, helped us scale at the level that we have. And I think that there's there's just, it comes down to the strategy and what's going on in the economy. I find it interesting yeah. that Jay talked about his roots come from mobile home parks. That's what I want to be doing right now. And the reason why is because when you look at demographics, you've got two generations, the baby boomers and the millennials who don't want to buy a personal residence. They, they need to, first of all, the, bo- the, the boomers can't afford it right now. It's horrible. They, they're looking to rent. And what they can't afford is mobile home parks and putting a mobile, a manufactured fancy home with the trims on the pad. That's what they can afford. So to me, I see a huge opportunity because they're coming into those years where that's where they're going to be. So there's a huge opportunity for mobile home parks. So me looking at apartments and multifamily investing where we've been for the past nine years, I see an opportunity where generationally boomers and millennials, they're, they're renting. So I'm going to continue doing apartments, but I also see that they're moving into RV parks, mobile home parks. So now I want to be able to look at different asset classes, but I'm not a perfect operator in that. So I know that with my strategy, I can go find operators of mobile home parks, RV parks, pick the best ones by vetting them, look at their track record and then raise capital to go invest in those deals. And there's just a lot of opportunity there. So I, I think with it for us, we're just all about strategy 
and having options. And right now, those are the options that we see available to us. And 506Cs accredited only allows us to scale. It allows us to advertise. It allows us to, to be a magnet for those accredited investors and serve them, not ask them for money, but provide opportunities and serve them. I don't know if I answered your question completely, Mike, but... Uh, some of it, yeah. And so it sounds like um, 506C accredited only, but you can advertise um, openly to the public uh, for, for your deals. Are you then um, operating as a fund? So people are, are investing more in a fund or is it still deal to deal? Uh, Mike! Mike, shh, you, don't you, Mike you're my best fun. friend. You're my best friend right now. We just became best friends because <laughs> no. right now, <laughs> right now, no, it's not a fund <laughs> yet. Yet. Uh, we definitely this do the co GP <laughs> approach where an argument we, in the coffee house. This is, this is something that we need to, we're trying to, we'll just say, we'll, we'll make a decision by the end of March. <laughs> We're getting into the facts, the details, and all the things. Uh, but yeah, we use a co-GP approach where when we join the deal, we're, because of our experience, we are typically coming in as advisors on the deal, helping to advise the team on the asset management side of it. And we're also controlling all of the investor relations because it's, well, it's usually our database that we tapped into to fund the deal. So that's our role. So we do co-GP approach. We are ex we are very excited to right hear discussion about a possible uh, different yeah. approach. So, yeah. you know, Stacy Stacey doesn't, she's not sure. She's not sold on the fund yet. And the reason why, and I yes. agree, we need more information yeah. because in a co GP opportunity, you can go in and you're part of the GP and you get equity, you get cash flow, you get the acquisition fees, you get access to all of that. And with a fund, it looks like you don't. It looks like you just get a percent of whatever money you've raised. And therefore, we need to really just myth bust that and figure out what's real and i'm gonna i know she has something to see i could hear her no i didn't deep breath in. Not, you know, just breathing you didn't know if I, you didn't we're know having this fight a, club we're having a battle <laughs> within a battle so this is uh this is good so so <laughs> Jen, when you were saying when you were saying going you've been going in as, as a gp you're talking about being a general partner right yes sir yeah so, um, um mike i don't know if y'all's audience knows what a general partner is and if jen wants to take a second the Talk about the difference between a general partner and having money for a fund. But, hey, you're the host, not me. <laughs> yeah, we, we do get down in there, but it is an important distinction. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, Jen, you started down that path a little bit where, as a general partner, you you are a partner in one specific deal. Or I guess it could be multiple, but typically it's like it's a deal where you become uh, a, a a general partner versus a limited partner where the passive investors are coming in and investing and, and they, um, they get to enjoy the benefits of the returns, but not necessarily have uh, a say so voting rights. And, and uh, I don't necessarily want to drill down into the um, different types of splits, right? General partners taking 20 or 30% of a, of a deal's asset versus 80 70 on the on the limited partner side i think we're we're kind of drilling into a, a different different part of the um matchup here but it, it, those are important distinctions and, and that's why i was curious if if uh, this was more of a fun style or, or still deal to deal so it sounds like it's deal to deal the other aspect of the question was um the typical return profile that that um you guys are looking as part of your deals um and and what that plays out to. I know it's a, it varies a little bit deal to deal, but I think in multifamily and, and some of these syndications, it's, it's a fairly, um, standard profile that, uh, that people are offering, um, investors. Well, I, I think that for us, it's, um, it's a little bit less about going for any specific return. And it, when Jen was talking about, depending on what's going on in the market, like our strategy, we ebb and flow through, when things are changing, we change too. So like one of the changes that we made when interest rates started going up in our own personal investing, which is whatever we do personally invest, it bleeds immediately over into the capital raising because in order to sell someone on an opportunity, I have to believe it. I have to be able to put my own money into it and believe it's good. So for example, you know, value add was, that was like our jam for a long time. Interest rates were low. All the deals that were out there were value add, you know, three year timeline, maybe five, five is kind of long. And when interest rates shifted and then they spiked very quickly, the immediate adjustment we made was to no longer look at anything that was only value add. 
And, and part of it was there was a lot of wisdom that we gained out of 2008. There's a lot of pain about 2008. There's a lot of wisdom that came from that pain. And immediately I was like, I don't want to buy anything that doesn't cash flow from day one. When things cash flow from day one, they are going to be lower returns. It's just, it just is what it is because that's it. Risk and reward go hand in hand. So the reward is lower. The risk is also lower. But based on everything that I had been through in my own personal journey, I was like, I don't care. If it's not cash flowing from day one, it's not worth the risk to me. So our investing profile, which is also our capital raising profile, they're the same, was looking for stabilized assets that also have value add. Because it's just the stabilized one by itself is, it's hard to stomach those returns. They're just, they're just not sexy. Um, so if we can find something that's cash flowing, you know, at least decent, doesn't have to be crazy high, but decent, but there is value add opportunity for us to increase the cash flow and increase also the NOI and that's the value that became our, our focus. So every deal that we've done since then has matched that exact thing. Every deal that we've raised for Mm -hmm. has matched that exact thing. And until, frankly, until interest rates, we see them like go back down and we feel like things are actually legit stable because they're a little, I just, I don't know yet. We won't get into anything that's less than five years. That was another shift we made. We won't do any three-year deals. And that's just because I re- it took a while. Uh, 2008, it did not recover that quickly. It took a while before things recovered. And not only do I want our not want our own money into something that we can't successfully get out of at the end of it. I definitely don't want to bring anyone else's money in. So we immediately dropped any three-year projects we were looking at and focused on five and even seven. Seven's a little bit harder to raise for. It, it's definitely a different kind of investor who's more ready for just cash flow. Uh, but those are the adjustments that that we made. And, we're, and even we're looking at a mobile home park right now. And we will. it already is cash flowing, not a lot, but it it's like it pays for itself. And so no, even if the value never went up, it's still a safe investment. And that's, that's just kind of where we've landed as far as like, so it's not about a number. It's more about, does the strategy match what's going on as far as our risk profile? But generally, if we're looking at stabilized and uh, with value add, yep. they're usually in the, you know, the first year is usually lower, like maybe 5%, but between 5 and 8% over the project hold period, just cash on cash. And then the average, like the average return on investment including the exit, including the sale is usually in the 11 and a half to 13 and a half percent annualized average return on investment. So what's yeah. that? Annualized yeah. average. Yeah. Yeah. And of course it might end up being higher than that. This is just, you know, we're super conservative in our projections sure. because sure. we've been on the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in general, that, that's what I was trying to, to get to. Um, let's say we come and we, we place a hundred thousand dollars in an investment with you. We can expect somewhere on the, you know, five to $8,000 a year in, in a cash distributions. And then some type of event in five to seven years, typically a sale where a larger amount will be and everybody shares in that profit. And, and that averages out to be somewhere in the 10 to 20 range usually yeah. uh, on average, depending on the sale, really obviously. Correct. But here's an important distinction, I think, between the two of, of you guys. Um, so just in my experience, even even buying a cash flowing asset using leverage or debt, ha- you know, the, the implications there are, uh, you know, something can be cash flowing positive, but then there's your cost of debt. And so you have to be really careful. And this is where a lot of people are getting burned in the in the last year or two is that they took out floating debt. And so the interest rates are subject to to float up and down. And with the interest rate spike, as you mentioned, um, a lot of properties are underwater because the cost of servicing their debt is more than the profit that the, the, the property is making. And so, Jay, I want to flip over to you because it sounds like this is where you're capitalizing on a different business model to just cut out the um the debt or the leverage and that whole situation and you're 100 percent funding deals with uh private money and so maybe give us a bit more about you know what that looks like from an investor standpoint and and what your uh end-to-end process is in terms of getting the property f- fixing it up and then flipping it Sure. Um, well, all of you all have said some really important um, things that I want to comment on real quickly. First of all, Jen and Stacy, there's two words that you all used more than one time as you're explaining 
your history and what you've got going on. And those two words that you used were adjusted. And the other word you used was shifted. And so I want to share this with the audience. And that is, do not, my advice, do not get, if you're new and if, you, if you're if you not, you know, if you, you haven't done deals yet or whatever, and I'm talking to the real estate investor or the one that's interested in being an investor, do not even start getting in this business unless you believe you have got resiliency in your heart. Because let me tell you, it ain't going to go as you think it's going to go, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you can have you can have the best coaches in the world. You can have Jen, you can have Stacy, you can have myself, you know, Mike and team. I mean, you can have the best coaches in the world and you can get all the knowledge. But let me tell you something. Um, <laughs> like if you're into rehabbing, I ain't had the first house come on budget out of over 500 rehabs, right? That's right. that's why I mean I mean, Murphy shows up, Murphy shows up. And sometimes Murphy's cousins and aunts and uncles show up with the unexpected. Right. And so that's why the magic is in the offer, not in getting the repair, budget exactly right. So, so not to get into the weeds, you must have a resilient um, character about yourself. And how's the best way to be resilient? I can tell you the best way to be resilient. Make sure you're hanging around people of like minds that are doing what you're doing and have been down the road, for goodness sakes, don't start in this business by yourself. Anyway, I just wanted to give that comment. Now, back to what I'm doing in my business model. So everything that I do in the world of single family, I'm not raising any private money for a fund. All right. So what I'm doing is very similar to what Jen and Stacey have been doing. They've been raising money like myself for um, that, that, well, I raised money just in general with no deal attached to it. And then, as you heard me say, when we started it out the show, now I call them up with the good news phone call. I can now put your money to work. So all the deals that we do are what's called one-offs, one-offs. So what do we mean by a one-off? A one-off means that we have a property, a single family house, in my case, um, commercial or apartments or mobile homes, whatever, in Jen and Stacy's case, but I've got a property. And now I've got a private lender or maybe a couple of private lenders that are going to fund that property. Well, it's a one-off, private lender, property. So each of those private lenders uh, are going to get their own promissory note. And very important, they're going to get their own mortgage or their own deed of trust, right? And so we're not borrowing unsecured money. We're backing all of their promissory notes with the real estate that we're purchasing. Now, the other comment I want to make as far as what am I, what have I been doing in this climate of interest rates going crazy? I mean, interest rates going crazy is why the burr er, 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 er method don't work anymore, right? Because when you go to when you go to burr er, er, er yourself and refinance on the back end, now you're upside down with where the interest rates are. Well, here's why my model is working. Remember. In this world of raising private money and doing business with private lenders, we make the rules. You see, when I was borrowing money from the banks, they made the rules. The bank and the institutional lenders set the interest rate. They set the term. They set the frequency of payments. Um, and, you know, they have to look up your skirt at all of your personal information and verification of income and all that kind of stuff. Well, in this world, we make the rules. I, as the borrower, and it took me a little bit to get my mind wrapped around this. There's no negotiating with my private lenders. This is the program, right? And if you like another program, then go invest your money in some other program. But this is my program. So here's what's interesting. Did you know ever since 2009, I've been paying the same exact interest rate to my private lenders from 2009 until today? I don't care what the market's doing. I don't care what the market's doing because I'm making the rules. I've been paying 8% interest only, interest accrued, uh, no principal and interest payments because that's a win for the private lender. They have more of their money invested uh, or keep it invested until we cash out. So prior to COVID, a 12-month certificate of deposit yield got down to an average in the banks of 0.17%. Prior to COVID, 
0.17% for a 12-month CD. I was paying 8%. Today, I mean, you can go down to First Citizens Bank right now and get a, a, a an eight-month CD for uh, 5%. Guess what? I'm still paying 8%. And my private lenders love it because 8% is a whole lot better than 5%, right? I've had one out of 47 private lenders call me up and say, Jay, rates are going up. Are you going to go up on the rate that you're paying? And I say, well, what I do is I always pay a considerable amount more than you can get at the local bank. So if you want to go get 4.5% instead of my 8%, that's up to you. Well, what do you think they did? They stayed with me at 8%, right? And so, uh, again, it's all about – see, here's the deal. There's more money out there chasing us than we've got deals in order to make an opportunity. Right. And so, I mean, the, I mean, we've gotten thank you notes. We've gotten thank you phone calls from our private lenders because we've been a part of changing their retirement years. They don't want to touch their principal. They want to have supplemental income. Right. So now here's another important point. And I'll give it back to you, Mike. Here's another important point as to why this works. You see, not one of my 47 private lenders had ever heard of private money or private lending or self-directed IRAs until I put on my teacher hat, right? And started teaching about private lending. Now, if you're doing business with, you know, family offices, if you're doing business with existing private lenders, that's a whole different conversation because you ain't putting on your teacher hat. You're now negotiating the rate with them because they've already been in the business of being a private lender. I'd much rather be a teacher than a negotiator. Love that concept. Yeah. Likewise. Um, I think, although there's a lot of people that really enjoy the negotiation aspect of things. So there, there's a lane <laughs> for them. So I, I love that concept. Um, for people that you, for people that come into your deals, Jay, what's, um, how does that, how does that work in terms of, so you say they, they get their own promissory note and mortgage are are they locked into a certain time period or what's what's the the framework around that uh, arrangement yeah so the length the length of the note is 2 years 2 years but typically i'm not using the money for more than probably 9 months i mean in this you know I, I do business with three different general contractors and i got two of my own crews so i got 12 houses going on at the same time in some kind of phase and i may have three of them sitting out there I mean, I may have some of them sitting out there for three months waiting to start. So typically we're in and out right now in about a nine month to 12 month period. But here's the deal. The length of the note really doesn't matter in my world because when I, when I cash out on the property, the private lender, they don't want the money back anyway, because when I give them the money back, they're not making any money. Right. <laughs> and so they say all the time, particularly a new private lender, they'll say, Jay, can't you just keep the money? Can't you just keep the money? And of course, the answer is no, I can't keep the money unless I've got a property to secure yeah. your note. Yeah. Okay. So they enter into a deal. You're paying them out quarterly or monthly or just at the end? Or I leave it up to them. I leave it up yeah. to them. Um, so I've got some private lenders that are living off of the interest or helping them live off the interest. Okay. So we pay them monthly. Yeah. Um, if they're loaning us money from their self-directed IRA account, we'll pay them either quarterly or semi-annual. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. And I have a I have a question. All the deals are kept in house, so you find those deals for the private money investors. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're, these private lenders are funding our own deals now. I've got a mastermind group, which is our elite coaching group. And I provide private money for their deals if they need it from my private lenders for my mastermind members. Okay. And then of course we then we joint venture, you know, on, on those with the with the mastermind members. But yeah, mostly it's all of our own deals. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I know we're, uh, so Lydia and I are going to go offline here just a bit and confer about what uh, we've taken in so far. Jay, I know you have a book that uh, you're, you're happy to offer the audience. I'll let you plug that while we, um, while we kind of do that. And then Jen and Stacey, I know you guys have one also that you can feel free to, to share. Well, thank you. 
So uh, while they have muted themselves out so we cannot hear what they're saying, I don't know, Jen and Stacy, can y'all read lips, see what, what, see what they're coming up with? But anyway, <clears throat> yeah, for the, for the audience, I've got a book here. Oh, they got smart now. So I got a book, and this book will show you step-by-step step how to get all the private money for your real estate deals and never miss out on a deal. The name of the book is Where to Get the Money Now, and the subtitle is, is How and Where to Get Money for Your Real Estate Deals Reli Without Relying on Hard Money or Institutional uh, Lenders. This is a book book. This is not an e-book. Uh, the post office is still in business, believe it or not. And so I'll autograph it. I'll ship it to you. It's 20 bucks on Amazon, but you can get the book for free. All I ask you to do is just cover shipping and postage, and we'll rush it right out to you. Three-day priority. You can pick it up at www.jayconner, with an E-R, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash book. Again, that's Jay Connor, J A Y C O N N E R dot com forward slash book, and we'll rush it right out to you. Three day priority. All right, appreciate that, Jay. We'll get that in the show notes as well. And um, I'm assuming that's the best entry point for people that want to get in touch with you and figure out how to uh, make some money off of their money. Right Absolutely. On. Okay, Janice, Janice, Stacy, what's a good way to get in touch with you? And any um, any other things you guys want to share with the audience? Uh, two things. So we have a book. It's the multifamily freedom hacking, your playbook to long-term cash flow. You can get it on Amazon. It's $9 and 97 cents, or you can, you know, go to warriors, www.warriorsofwealth.com where we have a curated list of our blueprint on exactly how we have invested in 2,500 doors so that you can do the same thing. So those are the two resources we have for you. Awesome. Thank you all for that. And so we've we've done a little offline conferring and great business models, both of them. They're, they're wonderful ways to put your money to work for you, leverage the power of real estate. Uh, we're huge fans um, and, and do a little bit of all of this. But um, in this particular matchup, Jay, we're going to give the champion award to you for private money. We are uh, a little down on banks these days. So uh, anytime we can cut out the middleman, uh, we're going to go that route, uh, at least until things shift again. But but um, yeah, congratulations. And like I said, these these are all wonderful ways to put your money to work. So well, you really well, I must say, Je I must say, Jen and Stacy is the toughest competition I've ever had on a matchup here on the uh, <laughs> on podcast. <laughs> Fair <laughs> point. So much in common. I'm just I'm just gonna reach out to you and see if you want to raise some money for our deals. I love I mean, it. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> I know we all have uh, a hard stop here, so um, I'm just going to cut it short here really quickly. But thank you all for coming on, sharing your wisdom. Yes. Um, wish you nothing but success in the future. And um, yeah, for the audience, uh, you can't go wrong with either of these two. But thanks again, everybody. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. That was such a fun matchup. I really had fun with those two guys. It really was. And we hope you enjoyed it on the Cashflow Fight Club podcast today. If you want to get in touch with either of these two creative gentlemen, Che Knott is best found on LinkedIn at Che Knott. That's C-H-A-Y-N-O-T-T. -T. He also has a great website, Knott Shots, N-O-T-T-S-H-O-T-S dot -T -T com. That's Che Knott and knotshots.com. Also, if you want to get in, coach with, uh, get in touch with Danny, you can find Danny at Danny Del Vecchio on LinkedIn. That's the best place. He also has a great website, coachdannyd.com. We'll drop both of those into the show notes. And again, thanks for joining us today on the podcast. We'll catch you next time. For those of you tuning in, we thank you so much for investing your time with us on the Cashflow Fight Club podcast. We certainly had a blast, received some knockout insights, all while learning something new. And we hope you did too. If you had fun, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you watch or listen. Lydia and I truly believe the beauty of cash flow is having your money fight for you instead of you having to fight for money. So whether it's one of these methods or something else, we encourage you to dream big and take action. See you next time.